In this episode, we're going to go through and do a light overhaul on this engine, put it back together here in the shop behind the house with minimal tools, get a couple more seasons out of this engine, and hopefully a couple more wins. All right, y'all stick around because we fixing to get busy. If you've been following along on our episodes in Dirt Race Life, you'll know in the prior one when we tore this down, we'd done some initial measuring and checking, and I've got a slight ridge in the top of my cylinders. Now, a ridge in the top of the cylinders is where that the top compression ring doesn't go quite to the top of your piston. You've got to have some aluminum above it to hold that piston ring in place. Well, because of that, where that ring is at and it wears, it's going to cut back on those cylinder walls a little bit where it's at and it's going to leave a ridge at the top. It looks like this, where that I'll be, you know, in my case, I'm just one thousandth of an inch more here down in the bottom than I am up here. But that's got to go. I need that gone. And the reason I need that gone is because when I put the new piston in and I put the new ring in, that new ring is going to come up and it's going to get into where the cylinder size is changing right there. That can cause compression loss. That can cause me to have premature ring failure. Brings up another point. Because that we are just doing this at home and we're hand honing this and breaking the glaze and we're hand taking, you know, this ridge out. We're going to use a ridge reamer to do this. We're using the total seal here that's got a ductile iron top ring. And the reason that I'm using the ductile iron is because it's a little more forgiving. It can take a little bit more of that deformation. And as it's going from top to bottom in the cylinder, changing its shape is not going to make this ring fail near as easy as it would just a straight cast ring. First thing we're going to do is the ridge reamer. I've got about one thousandths right here. I already know and I've measured with a pair of calipers. And I know that from the top of the block down to where this ridge clears out is about 280 thousandths. And the reason I want to know that is because this ridge reamer has got a cutting blade on it. And I'm going to cut until I just clear where that ridge is at, where that ring came up and made a little difference in it. I'm just going to turn it clockwise and keep tightening it up and rotating it using some honing oil in there until I just cleared down to that point and then I'll quit. All right, with that said, I'm gonna cut this one right quick. We'll cut one together. And let's just put a little oil in here right quick. So I'm gonna rub a little bit of honing oil. I'm just using the Flex Home uh, honing oil. It doesn't matter, just make sure. Uh, you can use transmission fluid for years. I just use transmission fluid and I'm just going to tighten that up. Only turn it clockwise. Don't back up. Don't get it real tight and like bark into it and stop and create because you'll create like a ridge point. I just want a nice, and that's what I'll do. I'll just keep going around and I'll just take a little tighten up. Now, that cylinder may not be perfectly round, and for that reason, it might go tight loose, tight loose, tight loose. Don't freak out about that. Remember, I haven't honed the cylinder yet, and I don't want to hone it because if I honed it right now, the honing rock would be up against the ridge and then contacting down in the bottom here, um, and I'd have a gap through the middle. It really messed me up. So I need to cut this ridge out of the top before I do anything else. So I'm getting some cut on it. And I'll just keep coming around. Now, if you get really tight on a ridge ring of cutting a lot of material, this thing's going to want to ride up on you. And you can be in a case where you need to cut a lot of material for some type of a rebuild. But, uh, but like what we're doing on race engines, if you've got much at all going on right here, you need to be having the block board. And to be clear, full disclosure, if this block was not 60 over, I would be boring it. We are just doing this because this engine's done otherwise. I can invest a couple hundred dollars here and I think I can get some more life out of this engine. But the alternative is it's going to the scrap pile anyway. So I'm okay with going ahead and doing this. So just be aware, there are some decisions here being made about whether or not to even go for this. If it was 30 over and I had that ridge and cut it, I'd take this block to machinist and just go up to 40 to take it on to 60. Um, and have a lot more confidence, you know, that it was going to go many more seasons by doing that. All right, so I'm just looking. You can hear it. It's cutting now. Oh, yeah. Okay, so look right here. See that shiny edge right there? 
that's where it's starting to cut in and take that ridge out the top, okay? I'm gonna keep going and turning and slowly tightening up until I get all the way down to the distance I measured. So I need to go 280 thousandths from the top down to here. That's where my actual difference is. And the reason that I took a measurement with a pair of calipers where I can take like my bump stick and, and see where I'm at like that is because as I get close to it, it's gonna get hard. Right now I can feel that point real easy with my finger. But as this line moves down to it, that's going to become hard to feel. And I don't want to go further than that because that just makes me have to open the whole cylinder up to get all of that blended back together. So I'm just going to keep cutting, go on down until I get to that point, and then I'm going to stop. The way I do this, once I get in there and I get that cut going like that, so now I've got that cut going, I'm going to just get my hand, a little honing oil on my hand or transmission fluid. It really doesn't matter. You can use either one. But I'm going to just rub a little bit on there as I go. I'm going to constantly put a little bit of oil because I'm trying to keep it from hanging up and biting into it because I don't want any type of a cut line that bit into the side of that cylinder that, you know, my honing blocks won't necessarily take out. All right, I got to get to cutting now. All right, I bet that's plenty. So y'all see what we're doing here. I'm just cutting until I get down to that ridge and I'm stopping once I've cleared that off. All right, that's all it is to it. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna hone this block. Now, I'm gonna use two different stones. I'm gonna use a 180 and I'm gonna use a 280. Now the 180, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna use it first to get a good rough break on the glaze, create those really deep ridges and stuff and break that glaze out. And I'm gonna do some sizing with it. So that's gonna smooth up where I cut that ridge off of the nose right there. That's gonna take all of that, make it uniform. And down at the bottom, I'm gonna have some taper in it because my ring wear, it looks like I uniformly added about 2,000. So my rings took the bore out 2,000. And then when I get down to the bottom, on my original, where it was just on, you know, my actual skirts of my piston. And so down at the bottom, I am right on 60. And up the top, I'm at like 62. That's what I'm pretty well consistently seeing. You know, it can be five tenths either way, cylinder to cylinder, but it's fairly close. And so I've measured all these. Well, what I'm wanting to do here is with my 180 rocks, when I go in here and do this, I'm going to tighten up until I start getting bite on my upper part where my rings ran. And so I'm going to get some cut going on that and then I'm going to drop into my lower part and it's going to load up in the lower part. But what I'm going to be doing is, is I'm going to be opening that up. I'm not going to be able to get all the taper out of it, but I'm going to take some out. In other words, I'm going to take more cut on the bottom of it to bring it up to what I've got on the top up here. I'm not wanting to take a lot of material off, so I'm just gonna bring it out until I'm breaking the glaze up in the top half, but then when I drop into the lower half, I should feel it load up on the drill. This is a very imprecise process. The key here is to not take a lot of material over off of it, and then also, don't go slamming your rocks off into your crankshaft mains because you're just gonna tear your rocks up right off the bat. The reason I'm using this hone instead of a three blade is because I know I have some taper in this that I'm wanting to take out. A three blade hone uh, that can wiggle back and forth just breaks the glaze. And then a ball hone is really only for establishing crosshatch. I just go nice and slow, use lots of oil, trying to start the bottom, and I'm about there. All right. All right, so you can see I'm all the way up my ridge here. I've smoothed all that together, and then all the way down through here. And see, I'm doing it by hand, but see that 45 or maybe a little less? I'm trying to not be more than 45 right here. But those crosshatch patterns is from me going slowly in and out. You can see them there. And like right there, 
I'm just barely, so that's where the most wear was in the cylinder. See how I've just barely broke the glaze right there? I might could stand to go a little more. Um, only, I'm going to go ahead and do all the rest, but uh, I'll measure, and if I need to, I'll just hit it just a hair more right there. I'll tighten the rocks up just a little bit more and get that and see where I'm at. All right, so I got all eight holes done. Um, I cut them with 180 grit all the way around, got them all opened up to the same size, um, ended up going back over all of them just to make sure I got all of them evened up and uh, got everything, my crosshatch pattern all the way through. Now I have switched, I have switched to a 280 here on my stone. So I've got a set of 280s and on these, I'm not trying to size or take out any material really with these at all. All I'm doing with these is the 180, when I went through with the 180, the peaks and valleys that the 180 leaves when it cuts through, they're really, really rough, which is fine. And it will break in and it would sit in a set of rings, but it's going to take more time for the rings to cut and fit into that. And I'm going to have a lot more debris and material that ends up in my oil pan when it gets done breaking in as well. And I don't, I'm going to take and run the 280 back through there and knock that down. Don't put as much wear on my rings to start with. Not going to have as much material ends up in my engine after the break-in process. Um, it's going to break in faster. Get that speed just right. There we go. So all I'm doing is just knocking the top off. If I put a lot of pressure on this and I kept turning the pressure up and I just kept going, what would happen is, is I would take all of the rough cut of the 180 out of it. And that's not what I want to do. I'm just trying to kind of knock the, the peaks of the 180 off, not take the whole roughness of it out. Like on that cylinder wall, if that 180 is like this, and like if a 280 is say like this on the roughness, well, what I'm doing is when I take that 180, I'm running over it, I'm doing like this. I'm knocking the peaks off and making them that roughness on the peaks of those. And then that helps for that ring. When it ring is going up and down on that, it helps it to go ahead and find that natural seat but that 180 I originally did, see that creates an oil valley right there. If I had just done a 280 to start with, when it knocks down and gets smooth on that 280, there's not much room for that oil to be in there. And so that's why you know, you'll hone it with a coarser rock and then go to a smoother rock, is that. So if you don't, if you didn't put the smoother rock on, if you just have one set of rocks that's like 180 grit rocks, 150s, you know, anywhere in there, that's okay. It's just that as that ring has to go up and down to wear those down and find that seat, it just takes longer to do it. And that material that it takes off there, that all goes into your oil pan. You know, and your motor's got to absorb that, you know. Um, so we can just avoid all that. We can get a, a quicker break-in time on the engine, um, have it good to go, you know, within, a, you know, it running for an hour. You know, we take this engine, we're going to let it run, cycle it a couple times in the shop, be tuning on it, and it'll already be good to go. I'll change that break-in oil out of it, and when we go to the track, we're good. All right, so that's the reason for that. All right, so the home's complete, and I need to get this block ready for us to wash it. Wash all the oil galleys out, wash everything on this block. Now, I have all of my oil galley plug holes, they've been tapped where that I can use thread in plugs on them. Makes it really easy. I can just pull those back out, wash everything, put them right back in. I really like doing it that way. But if I didn't, I would have to have an extra set of plugs, knock those out, and then after I wash it, knock the new ones back in and everything. Um, what I'm doing here, I've got some green scotch bright, and I need to go ahead and get these decks ready to go. Uh, and an important point here, this has been machined and I've got an RA finish on this that works for me to use a steel shim head gasket. So I'm using that Felpro, I checked to see what the number was, it's 1094. That's only a 15 thousandths steel shim head gasket. Now you can't always use that. Um, I'm able to do it because the pistons are sitting 20 thousandths down in the hole. 
And so overall, that's giving me that 35 thousandths quench, you know, and if you've got less than that, you'll get into trouble because when the rod and the piston assembly heats up, it actually gets taller and you'll end up striking against your head and then you can have catastrophic failure. Uh, but green scotch bright because I don't want to change the finish in any way. I don't want to use any type of sandpaper. Nothing that can actually take metal away. All right, I got this side ready. I'm going to get the other side ready to go and then it can get pressure washed. We can get all that loose metal debris and oil out of this thing, get it ready for us to start putting it back together. I was fixing to roll this thing out and start washing it and I was going through my list and I had forgot I needed to chase every one of these holes for these head bolts. So the tap on the small block Chevrolet is a 7 16ths by 14 pitch and so you just want to run through all of your threads on your head bolts where they go and uh, shouldn't have a fight with any of them. None of them should really be tight or anything. But you should do this because if you have an issue with them, if any of them's got a pulled thread or something, that could give you a false reading whenever you're tightening your head bolts down. You can have a head bolt that's not torqued down like it's supposed to. It, it's clicking on your torque wrench or giving you that reading, but it's a, a bind in the thread that is causing that instead of actual stretch and load on the bolt itself. And so this is something that I always do. And of course, since it's gonna create debris, do it before you wash your block. So I'm gonna run through these right quick and then I'm gonna get it out and wash it. dryer it's uh it's not wd-40 it's the stp brand but the same thing as wd-40 spray everything down wd-40 because it'll grab that water but uh this is just transmission fluid right here i'm gonna come right back and wipe this off but yeah when you wash one and you really get it clean like that after you've honed it they are gonna flash rust i mean literally right before your eyes so i'll roll it in here and once I started drying it, I just immediately, you know, went to this. Two. Okay, here's the deal, y'all. Um, like, I'm doing all of my measurement here on the crankshaft, documenting all my numbers for my clearances. And, of course, I'm going to go through, put all my mains in, check, do the math, and figure out what my oil clearances are. And then as I do the rods, I'm going to check those. I've got standard bearings, but I also have got sets of plus ones and minus ones for oil clearance if I need to, you know, I can add a thousandth or take a thousandth away, you know, on which bearing I use. Now, this is a cast crankshaft and I'm going with my King HP bearings instead of my XP's. I'm putting XP's in my force rotating assembly that is on my other build. An important note here, I'm not going to go all down into the details of how I'm measuring and then doing the math and getting the oil clearances and stuff on this build because we're covering that in our crate racing build. We've already got one of our episodes out there. I'll put a link to it at the end of this video where we did all our pre-assembly and got all our measurements and stuff. And then we took and the block and the heads I've got in a machinist having them milled now. And then that's going to pick right back up. We're going into de detail on that one, on all of this measuring and everything. I'm not going to cover the same ground twice on this refresh right here. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But I encourage you, check out that other video. And there's a couple more coming on it. If you really want to get down into the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty details, you know, on how I'm going about it and my logic and everything for doing this. I've got it all there. Doing the thrust bearing, the clearances on it, the whole nine yards. It's a good video. I hope to have several more good videos on that build as well. On this one here, we're going to move on forward with it. So I'm going to get all my measurements and we're going to get this crankshaft into the block.
So I've already slid my camshaft back in. I just put some molly on the camshaft. I didn't put cam break-in lube on it. Nothing like that because it's already been broke in. I've got match lifters going right back on the same lobes that they were on. So I'm really not concerned about the camshaft at all. So a little bit of molly, lube the bearings up, left the stock, the bear, bearings that were in the block, they were fine. Everything was great. Um, so I just slid the cam right back in. Did that right quick before I dropped this crankshaft in. I torqued everything down, checked my clearances on the crankshaft. It was almost um, where I needed to split the shells up and go to a minus one on the clearance, but I decided to leave it because it came up, all of my clearances across came up from three thousandths and two tenths to three thousandths and four tenths um, when I was measuring going through here. And if I went to a minus one, I'd have been a little tight. I'd have been right down around two, you know, two thousandths and two tenths to four tenths. It wouldn't have been exactly that. It's going to change, you know, as you change that up. I could have went to a half a shell that was a minus one with one of them being standard and took half a thou out. But, you know, I was looking at it, you know, the bearings that were in there, I was more than that clearance on them. The engine was very happy. It was giving me... 40 pounds of oil pressure, hot idling, 70 and 80 pounds down the straightaway. And I'm like, this crankshaft is happy. It's good. I'm going to continue to use a milling 55 high volume pump in it. I'm going to continue to use the 50 weight oil in it. So we're going to leave it at that, you know, a little over three thousandths um, and just let it continue on and continue to be happy like that. Um, that I would say that's my limit. Um, we had talked about this, like I said, in our other video where we're building our crate racing motor. But, um, you know, it's right up there. And, like, especially on my other engine where I'm putting that forged crank in and everything. You know, yeah, I probably would say, yeah, let's go a half a shell if I needed to. Which I didn't. Um, but I probably would have. On this engine right here, I already know what it's happy with. I'm going to let it do the same thing it's been doing and just continue to be happy. Yeah. I think if I can get it right, there it goes. You don't want to drop it. Okay. All right, let's start getting them pistons and rods ready. You can see I got a lot of carbon buildup over several seasons on these, and it's pretty rough. And it's more than I can just scrape off with a scraper. It's, it's a lot. And the way that I do these, I like to use, so here's what I'm using. This is a paint removing pad. That's a paint fiber paint removing pad, and I use a two inch because it can get in those eyebrows. I think I'm there. Right, and then, of course I'm not worried about these rings, but I tell you what, you be careful because these rings after they've been run like that, they get sharp, buddy. After they done got a lot of wear on them, they will get razor sharp. So I'm just jerking them off. You see that one broke, they're brittle. And let's see. I'm just gonna show you right quick if I can get these off. Not saving any of this, so I'm not worried about it. That's why you see me just grabbing it with pliers because it don't matter. But I'm not gonna have to clean my grooves out. My grooves are clean as a whistle. I have no carbon, 
You want to check, make sure you don't have carbon up in the land on the sides this way or in the bottom of it, either one. If you do, you got to use a, a, a ring groove cleaner and clean that out. But these are great. So I got all my pistons, everything's cleaned up on the sides here. I had a little bit of carbon on the side, took a scotch bite to it in the parts washer, went through with a parts washer, made sure everything was clean, cleaned out any imprints that were inside of the rods here. Um, blew it all dry, wiped it with a clean, lint-free, which I just use white t-shirts that I've cut up is good for this stuff for me. That's what I use. But uh, anyway, uh, these Eagle, uh, these are the Eagle 5140 rods, and they come with those ARP 8740 3.8 bolts, cap bolts, and they work fine. They torque to like 40 foot-pounds with the ARP lube, and that's a combination. So like that ARP, their torque for that bolt is specifically for their bolt with their lube don't go by that when using somebody else's bolt or some other lube or something and of course i've got the king hp bearings here i'm going to put these shells in i'm just going to check of course i've took all of my measurements on my crankshaft i've set my bore gauge to them to the average of the spread they were all within just three or four ten thousandths and i just set it in the middle of that and i'm going to go through and I'm just going to put all my bearings in, torque them up in a vise here where that I can check them. I don't expect to have a problem. Let's fit one set of rings right quick here. I want to show you how this works. Now, I went with the total seal. Um, this is the traditional, not the gapless. The gapless has got where it overlaps itself. This is the traditional, and I went with the file fit. And the reason that I went with these total seals is because I wanted that ductile iron top ring instead of just cast. Because I know I've got, you know, some non-uniform in that cylinder board itself. So the ductile iron is better able to handle that. And so that's what we went with there. Didn't want to go with chrome or anything like that. Not, not worth it on this engine. Um, wouldn't be appropriate for this engine the way it is at all. Just ductile iron is all I want here. I'm doing it cylinder by cylinder. As I get the rings done, I'm leaving them in the cylinder because I'm sizing them individually. I'm going with 20 thousandths and 22 thousandths. Good rule of thumb is four to five thousandths um, of clearance. It's in gap clearance, like with a feeler gauge right there, um, per inch of bore. So like on a four inch bore, you know, times four thousandths would be 16. Uh, there is on the hyperetics, you know, there's some talk about you need a little bit more gap that really has to do with the K and B pistons because that piston has got a really narrow top lip here and it gets a lot hotter. The top ring gets a lot hotter. Well, the hotter a ring gets, the more it expands. And so that K and B needing a lot more clearance has to do with that. If you want to really pay attention to their instructions, if you've got the K and B hyperetic pistons, but for these Speed Pros, they really don't need clearance any different from like a Ford's piston or any of the rest of them. And what I'm going with is I'm, go I'm going to go with 20 thousandths on the top and I'm going to go with 22 on the second ring. Now technically your second ring never gets as hot as your top ring. And so I'm adding a little clearance and then it's not going to close up as much either when it gets hot. But what it is is, is I always want to make sure that my second ring always has a bigger gap than my top ring so I never get compression pinched between the two rings and it pushing back up on this top ring and causing it to not have it seal anymore against the cylinder. So I always want my pressure to get, to get out from below the second ring if it gets trapped in between them. So I'm going with 20 and 22. So that's, so you say like on a four inch bore, 20 thousandths is five thousandths per inch of bore. You know, 22 is just a hair more than that. Um, so I'm being a little bit liberal with it, but um, that's gonna help me too, you know, as far as I've got a little bit of taper going on in these cylinders. I'm doing this, I'm gonna size them at one inch down in the bore. Um, and I'll just use a piston upside down and just use, you know, the side of it. I know about where an inch is. I'm gonna do it at one inch down in the bore that's how we're going to do it. Now, with all that said, I'm going to start with the second ring. And again, I know that because I know how to identify it here. And I've got my grinder here, and I'm just going to start out by dropping it in and seeing where I'm at. And so I'm going to take, drop it in here, take my piston, 
and I know when I push down to about right there where that wrist pin is, I'm just a hair over an inch, all right? And, of course, I'm going to 22. I got a 20 and a 22. Can't drop it in. No, it's too small, all right? And so, if you file fit rings, so I'm going to take and I'm going to push this up on my file here. And so I pushed, I got my hands, I'm squeezing, and I'm pushing forward in my two pins here, okay? And then when I turn this, you only turn them into the ring. It's real important that your cutting wheel cuts into the ring, not away from the ring. Reason being is you always want that edge of that ring to have the material cut back into it, never out from it. We do not want to create a sharp bird edge on this at all. So I'm going to just take, it doesn't really take a lot. So I'm going to take, give her a couple, give her a couple spins here. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I've got a little bitty rasp file. You could use a little jeweler's file, a stone. It really doesn't matter. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bump that edge right there. And I'm not going to hold it way out here and do this because that's cast. You can break that. So I'm just going to put my finger right there. I'm going to hit that edge right there. I'm going to hit that edge. I'm always going to do that anytime I've been on the stone and I'm going back in the block because even the smallest little razor's edge there can create a score in my cylinders. Drop it in here, take my piston, go right back down to my one inch, and then I'm just going until my finger. Now my 20 will go in now. My 20 was my top, here's my 22. That's gonna be that second one, and that's the one I'm working on. Just a little bit tight, all right? Now you don't have to be on the money. I could be, Honestly, I could be at 18, I could be at 24, and I would be safe. All right, so I always go into it, just like that. A little more like that. I didn't really cut a lot. Now, again, hit that right there. Those two corners right there, anytime I drop it in, I'm always going to do that. Piston man back. Sized up. All right, I know what 20 goes. I'm trying to get that 22. Okay, so now my 22 fits. All right, now I'm gonna pull it back out. Since I know I'm through filing on it, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna hit that top, that outside, and that bottom. Top, outside, and the bottom. The reason I'm doing that is I don't want a sharp edge on the top of the ring or on the bottom of the ring that could make it want to hang up in the piston and stop rotating. Um, you know, it's gonna, that's gonna polish really quick, but you know, we don't want it to stick. We don't want to have any burr or anything. It's just a safety thing. I always do it. All right, so that one's done. I'm gonna sit it right there, throw my top ring in. Same process. So we've got all our rings file fit sitting in the holes. Next thing up, we're doing the final assembly here. All right, so I'm gonna pull my rings out. Okay, I've already put one on the other side and I'm gonna go through. Of course, our bearings are already sized up. I had, biggest one, I had one that came up three and three tenths. Most all of them were right at three thousandths clearance. One was two nine. So I'm not worried about sizing them to the individual locations or anything like that. We're fine, we're gonna run it. And oh, that was rod bearing clearance I was talking about. So it was right at it, but kind of worked out just the same. It's the same amount of wear on the crank on both of them. And uh, anyway, so it worked fine. Okay, so we got it here. Clean this up. This is all washed, done. And the rings here, I want to make sure they are clean. All right, so I'm gonna put my oil expander down. You didn't see me file fit the oil ring, and I didn't, because you don't have to file fit oil, well, check each ring manufacturer, let me say that, but like for the ones I'm using here, and every one I've ever used, even on file fit rings, you don't file fit your, your oil ring, your scraper. You don't, it has plenty of clearance, lots of clearance. Okay, how do I do these? Now this is what I do. Each ring manufacturer will have instructions with them on how they want you to clock the rings, but here's how I clock them. I'll always put my oil expander with my wrist pins, 
And then I'll turn around and the two scrapers that go on each side of the expander, I just walk them on. And I try not to ruin them, but uh, I just walk them on and drop them in here. And I put them, so if, like, if that's 12 o'clock where the expander joint is, I'll go like two and two. All right, so I just do that right there. There's one. And I'll do the other and go over here on the other side and just walk it on there and try not to won't go in a second groove I can get it to start these are just steel but uh, they're pretty tough they're pretty tough they won't mess up okay so like that expander I've got, and they're all going to move around, y'all. This is just your starting point. But, uh, so if the expander was at 12, I do like 10 and 2 on it. And then I'll turn around. And, of course, I've, I've already identified and got in my head. I know how to quickly identify. That's a top ring. That's a second ring. All right, so we're going to put our second ring on. I am going to use a ring expander. I will warn you, I have broke a brand new ring before using a ring expander. And so I've gotten where sometimes I just walk them on by hand. Remember, dots always go up. But uh, I have broke one of these before using a ring expander. They can be aggravating. Um, it happens. Now, clocking wise, so the way I do this, this is just me, it's a preference. So like I put my oil expander and my two scrapers at like 12, 10, and 2. And I'll turn around and I take my, my second ring and my top ring and I'll turn around and go um, across ways like 3 and 9. Like that opposite. Like that. Um, my, I'm more interested in my second ring and my top ring just being opposite of each other. Again, they're going to rotate. They're going to cross each other and line up at times and then be opposite again. Uh, this is just your starting points, but um, just my preference, the way I do it. Every ring, set of ring instructions will sit there and tell you how to do it. It's much more important that you get your dots turned up or however the ring is identified with what is up on the face. That ductile ring at the top is really stout. So pushed up in there. And so like I'll take and just get those turned opposite of each other. All right, so I got some 30 weight oil here with a brush. And I've already cleaned my holes and cleaned my holes until, you know, like I take a clean rag and I'm wiping and it's just nothing, you know, clean, 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 clean. Everything's fine. We're good to go here. All right, so I'm just gonna take my brush here and straight 30 weight oil and I'm just gonna paint this. This might be overkill. It doesn't necessarily need a lot. Um, now you don't use assembly lube on your pistons here. You just use oil like that. You don't put assembly lube in your cylinder holes. And so you just see, I'm just take a brush. And 90% of this is gonna hit the floor or my shoe if I'm under it. Um, but anyway, okay. So now I got that. I like, uh, I got this little gem right here. I think I got this from my father-in-law. Anyway, um, ring compressor. This is one that's expandable. I like it because it's got these little ridges where it doesn't try to push in. The, the, the steel, the flat steel type that's just a band can try to jump in the hole with your piston and really mess you up. This one's got uh, extruded ridges, so it don't do that. I suppose the best ones are the ones that are just made for a particular size, but anyway. Okay, so I'm opposite each other, and I've already got a Chevrolet 4 inch Chevrolet mark. Got me a little yellow spot from years of use. And I'll just put that on there, flip that over. Okay, that's ready. Level it up just a little bit. Okay. All right, that's ready to go. Now, really, really important. A little bit of Mugandha juice right there. Okay. Really, 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 really important. There is a chamfered edge. There is a flat edge. Make sure your chamfered edge goes to the edge of your crankshaft. Your flat edge goes to the two rods ma matching each other. You can put it together. You can get it bolted up, and it will be tight. But it would work 
and then it will grenade when you crank it if you get that messed up. Um, so pay attention. All right. So now, and of course, these are four eyebrow pistons, so doesn't matter which way you go. It just so happens the way I'm doing this, I'll just tell y'all, every one of these, they were they have a, a marked front. They have a marked front, and I'm inverting all of these. And the reason being is, is because my anti my slip coat on there is worn towards the outside of the cylinder all the way around. So I'm rotating all of them. Um, and it's just going to help as far as my anti-slip coat is a lot thicker on the other side. Um, so I'm just inverting all my pistons. Um, that's just a preference that I'm doing here. And if this engine wasn't on its last leg, I wouldn't even be doing that. And let's see. So, all right, chamfer right there, flat right there. So you're going to go in like this. I'm going to drop you in the hole. Got the crankshaft rotate all the way down. That way I can knock this in without it hitting the crankshaft. That's very important. So I got her lined up here. And then, all right, just like that. Sits in the hole. I'm gonna turn around, rotate the engine over. Whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. So I'm gonna rotate my engine over like this so that I can take and put my hand on that rod. All right. I'm going to put a little 30 weight oil. And of course, I've wiped all this crankshaft and everything off like one last time here. And I'm going to turn around. Just push that up. And I got my finger, I got my finger on my rod here where I'm not going to bump it into piston. Or, I'm not going to bump it into the crankshaft. Now, remember, if I had rod bolts sticking up here, you know, with caps, cap nuts, then I would have boots on those where they didn't scratch anything. And then I'm just going to turn my crankshaft. And I'm down in it. So, yep. All right, so that's in there. I'm going to make sure that's seated. Yeah. The reason I'm doing that is so that if it's a little bit crooked, That'll square it up. Um, so it's important to kind of get it sitting on the crankshaft and then give it a bump where it'll seat up. Okay? Now I'm going to turn around. Put a little bit of molly right there. Remember, your bearing halves, your bearing halves, your stops on your bearing halves, the line locate them go against each other. Make sure you put it together correctly. You don't want to spin a bearing. So that goes just like it right there. And then, for this final assembly, I'm going to wipe my threads off on my ARPs. Put some fresh ARP lube on them. Like it. In the hole, guys. That is coming together quickly do not use an impact wrench doing this it's okay to take stuff apart with an impact but woo, don't put it together with an impact y'all don't even run bolts down with an impact you can accidentally like bump on them and you can hit way over torque really quick okay so now i'm just going to take and give it a little bit snug all right bump just my habits. I'm already set. Coming up about halfway. All right, so I've come up halfway on this one. Now on this one, one motion. One motion. And don't keep on click, click, click doing that because what's happening is, is you'll be incrementally overstretching it. So like if I just sat here and kept checking, like, you know, is it there, is it there, you know, and clicking it, Every time I click it, when I go through the click, it's going to pull that rod bolt just a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. Next thing you know, instead of stretching that bolt four or five thousandths, I done stretched that bolt seven or eight thousandths, and I've overstretched it, and it's going to fail. So, know your settings, have everything right. When you come up, you quit. One click, you're done. All right. So, that's 
that's it. Six more of those, just exactly the same way like that, and then we'll turn around and be ready to put the heads back on it. I'm cleaning up my heads, getting ready to put them back on. These are stock casting Vortex. They're 906s is what they are, and they're the same age. I got about four seasons on them as well. Um, one season in, I had broke a valve spring and changed one of the valves out. Um, and that's the only time these heads has had any repair, anything done on them. Got lucky when I dropped that one valve and it got bent, but it didn't strike the seat. And I literally just replaced the valve and went right back to racing. Uh, let's see. And when I originally had them done, they're still the 150 and 194, but I did switch the valves out and put like the stainless steel manly valves into them. And then... Uh, let's see and cut a, a deep bowl cut with a multi-angle job on the actual uh, pocket for the valve itself and cut the seats down and for the valve springs and then of course you know drilled and tapped it put guide plates on that's other than that these things are stock they've got no work done to them whatsoever i am just going to take i've got some carbon build up you can see right here i'm just going to take uh, my fiber pad and just clean that off same deal here, I'm gonna be careful not to get on my fire ring. Um, but uh, all I'm gonna do is just hit a little bit of this carbon where I can get to it, clean the heads of these valves right here off. And then I'm gonna put them in the parts washer, uh, green scotch brite, everything, they're gonna be ready to go back on. first head on let's do the second one together I wanted to point out here um, if you recall whenever I was putting the rings onto the piston and putting the compressor on them I took a brush and brushed that 30 weight oil onto it so there was 30 weight oil all down in and around the rings I don't worry about putting extra oil in on top of the cylinders you've got all that oil that's trapped in between the rings um, it's still there um, everything is fine and so, you know, you don't need to have a lot of oil sitting up on top of your cylinders, um, you know, to crank it up. Now, saying that, um, I'm going to set the engine up so that when I go to crank it, it's going to fire right off. I'm going to set the time correctly on it. I'm going to fill the float bowl up on the carburetor where that it's primed. You know, I'm not going to crank and crank and crank and crank. But that oil that's just trapped in between those rings... You know, for me, that's that's plenty. That's fine. There's no point in having all this oil sitting on top of these cylinders, risking a hydraulic lock, or you know, which could break a ring or bend something, you know, or just you know, smoking the whole shop out when we crank it up just because we did that. Um, so I just take, make sure that I've wiped, you know, a little bit of oil sitting around in here. Wipe all that off. Wipe it off the cylinders. They're fine. Um, I am going to. Clean my surfaces. Now we're using that steel shim, that 15 thousandths Felpro 1094 steel shim. And I am going to spray it with copper coat. But before I do that, I need to put my pins in. I put a new set. I was missing some pins. These are your alignment pins. Um, and so I need to put those. There's no exact point and just get them about halfway. All they do is align your head gasket and align your head for you. Your bolts themselves, they won't do a good job of aligning your head. And so, does that look right? Yeah, one more. That looks good. Okay, so. I'm going to make sure that that's wiped out. That's a little, little bit of an acetone here. I just want to make sure that I don't have any grease or anything. I'm going to spray copper coat on that gasket and then put it directly on this. And I want this thing to be clean and dry. Okay. And so I got my gasket here. And this is the Permatex brand copper spray gasket. All it is, this little embossed line, this, this bent edge right here. I'm just trying to, you know, put a little extra insurance on it. That's all this is. It's got a coating on it that technically is all you need. There's a little bit of a rubberized coating. Now, it's not like a composite gasket. 
but there is a, a rubberized coating on there but um i just always use this and it hadn't failed me yet so better safe than sorry Now that's good to go and then I'm just going to take and sit it on them two alignment pins right there and right there and I'm going to hold it where it don't jump on me and push it down on that one like that and that one like that. Just try not to put your hands on that little embossed ridge around there. That's that's what you're wanting to have, like if you're going to put a copper coat or something. It doesn't matter on any of the flats. The little ridge is what's actually sealing your water jackets and your fire ring and all of that. That's, that's what's actually doing the sealing. So, heads ready to go. Same deal. Of course, I've already cleaned everything, but just, you know, get that little bit of oily residue that might have been from your hands or something. I'm going to get that off. Now, when you sit these on here, Ideally, what you're going to do is, is you're going to try to hit those pins and then let it line up on the pins and drop. That way you're not smearing it across your head gasket. Um, <laughs> it's just pretty tough. I don't know that it's going to be the end of the world, but that would be the ideal scenario. So, all right, so yeah, let's see if I can find that. Oh, there it is. Find that exhaust port and grab it, put my finger in it. Okay. okay, I got it. And so I'm going to look down my bolt holes and hit that pin. And that way I drop straight onto it. All right, so it's on there. And it's on the pin, so I know it's, it's aligned right. Now, right here, important note. All right, so I've got OEM, OEM head bolts, okay? And they, some of them go into the water jacket, so they've got sealing on them, all right? So there's a couple of things. First of all, I don't trust that sealant that comes on those bolts. Not for one minute. So I've got sealant, okay? So this is the PTFE um, thread sealant right here. It's the white stuff. It's probably the same stuff as like some gas pipe, but I didn't say that. I'm just, it's probably... Anyway, and then turn around, and there's two considerations here. First, you've got to seal because you're going into the water jacket. And then the second one is, is that you've got to lubricate the bolt so that it torques out right. You know, your threads have to be lubricated. So I always apply fresh thread sealant. Now, technically, the sealant itself, like, acts as the lubricant. But anyway, I always apply fresh sealant to it for that. And so that's... that's lubricating it down into the threads and of course you remember i chased all of these holes in the block too make sure that it was all good but the other part of it is is that right here every one of these tops needs to have oil on it um, and this is really easy to miss but you need to have that lubricated and you either going to put it on the bolt head or you're going to put it on the block. I put it onto the head here, not on here because I don't want the oil running down and mixing with my sealant and stuff. And so what I do is, is I just take and I'll just take and I'll just touch every one of these. A little less. And I just hit it with just a little bit of oil because... When that head, if that, you know, I've washed this head and I've got it dry and clean and there's no oily residue or nothing on it. And so the bolt itself is new and it has no oily residue. So when it comes in contact on that shoulder at the top, well, that's going to give you a false torque reading. That's going to tell you you're torqued out and you're not. Um, or not where you should be. You know, in other words, it's going to, uh, 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 it's going to stop. Um, and so it can, it can get you. All right, so I got two shorts that go on the ends. So yeah, so I just take some fresh thread sealant. And two in the ends are a little bit shorter on a small block Chevy. So I'm gonna drop them in where I don't put them in the wrong holes. And then I'll turn around and just sit here and I would start dropping these. 
the wrong mat one, the wrong mat one, the wrong mat one. So these torque out, since these are OEM replacements, I went and grabbed my sheet that has been with me for a jillion years. Let me wipe that off. About 30 years ago, when I had an older gentleman, Mr. George Northcott, he was teaching me how to build engines, and I think he copied this out of a Chilton manual, probably. If any of y'all recognize that sheet, what'd that come out of? He copied that out of something. But that's got all of my torque ratings and everything. I got the ARPC, I got ARP stud, 75 foot pounds right at the top of it. But OEMs, uh, the OEMs is 65 foot pounds on these head studs is what they are. And this is a uh, steel shims, right, on, on there that I'm doing. So I gotta come back and I gotta retorque them. But what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna run these and I always run them to the patterns. I got on this page here that he gave me years ago. I got my pattern here for torquing them down. But I run them to the pattern, I'm gonna step them up. I'm going to take and I am going to go 40 foot pounds and then I'm gonna go 65 foot pounds today. And right now I'm just taking run them down to the contact. But um, but anyway, I'm gonna go 65 foot pounds. We're gonna put break-in oil in it. We're gonna break it in at 65 foot pounds on these head bolts. And then I'm turning around and uh, I'm gonna, when I change the oil in it to put the race oil in it and take it to the track and everything, before I do that, I'm gonna take, pop the valve covers off, check everything, make sure I'm good. And I'm gonna set my torque wrench to 70 foot pounds and I'm going to take them and I'm going to run through and take them all to 70. Um, anytime you're on a metal shim head gasket, you know, you need to always retorque. Um, the only ones like you wouldn't, the composites like Felpro's composite perma torque head gasket, you know, those, it's not a bad idea to do it regardless. We're done. Oil pumps on this motor is a Melling HV55. That's just a high volume, small block Chevy pump. And I'm um, putting the uh, strainer that was on it back on it. And make sure, check for cracks, anything like that. Now I want to reuse this because I know that my height is right from the bottom of the oil pan um, to my strainer right here. About a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch gap right there. You don't want to be less than a quarter inch because you think about it, if you ran over a tire or, you know, a dirt clod or something, you know, and you just pick, push that oil pan up, you could push it up enough that you actually seal that off and you could stop your oil flow right there. So for me, my minimum is about a quarter inch. And I think this one's right at a quarter, between a quarter and five sixteenths is where it's at. So I know it works well with this pump right here, but you need to check it on every one, you know, taking... When you put it in, measure with a tape measure, and then measure your depth of your oil pan. Make sure that it's good. If it's not, work on it. As far as failures go, like these milling pumps right here, I don't think that's where your failures is going to happen. I think it's going to happen from like your tube right here breaking, something happening to your pickup. Um, that's going to be, now I've never had one fail, but, um, but I would be watching this really close compared to the oil pump itself. But uh, put it on here and if I can get it to in there. Well, you book bear, I don't want to clamp too tight, it's just cast. But yeah, push it in there good and tight. Down, right there. A little bit of Loctite on that bolt. Drop it in there. And don't go crazy on your bolts or anything like that, which I only pull the one out. Because the rest, I would assume, there's a little bit of a material on it. I'm sure they're Loctite. It's what it is. So put Loctite right back. I don't know if there's a torque rating on them or anything. I never have. I just put Loctite on them and just pull them snug and leave it alone. But yeah. Get this oil pump ready and stick it on there. About that tight. Right. There. Quick. All right. Let's put it on. 
This is the area where people have got different opinions. Some people will run a gasket between the oil pump um, and the main cap right here. They make like a copper gasket for this, a paper gasket. Um, I don't think anybody should run any type of a sealant like silicone or anything because that's just going to push block oil passages is all that would do um, when it got off in there. But, uh, but yeah, people do different stuff like that. I don't run anything. I just put the block directly on it. And you're, you're, you're leaking oil everywhere, you know, like, like your crankshaft is dumping oil the whole way down through here. This oil is seeping around this uh, joint right here, which is going to be very minimal, if any, is nothing compared to with the oil that's flying off of this crankshaft right here. Um, so I don't put a gasket to me a gasket is something that can just crush down further and release the torque on my bolt I don't want to take a chance on it. Uh, I do use an aftermarket hardened shaft right here with the steel Retainer sleeve don't use like a stock one with that nylon piece right there. That's junk But uh, I do use an aftermarket one um, on here and Drop that in there All right and make sure that you use the right length bolt on this because if you use too long a bolt by accident, this bolt goes directly down and hits into the bottom of your bearing shell, ruins your bearing, ruins your crankshaft, like it's, it's a disaster. Make sure you're using the right bolt right there. And we'll put a little bit of on that, wherever that is, fresh steel there. And I think that stock torques to 65 foot pounds on this bolt right here. So no big deal there. But yeah, I don't use a gasket or anything. And the critical thing for me is to take a tape measure when you set up a, a new pickup and a new or a new pan or a new pickup, either one. All right, here we go. There it is. Yeah, new pan or new pickup, either one. Take a tape measure and measure from there down to your, your rail right there and get that measurement and then check the oil pan and compare the two. Because like I said, you don't want less than a quarter inch here. In my opinion, more than three eighths is too much. You need to, you need to make a change, get a different pickup uh, for it. Because these different pumps, according to which pump you use, they do actually have a different height. You know, it, it varies. Look them up in the catalog and stuff. It will vary pump to pump, you know, which you can change which pump you're using in some cases to probably fix a problem you've got with that. But uh, you got to pay attention to it, y'all. Hang on, one more thing um, before I take and button this up. I'm going to pour just a little bit of oil. And that's going to run right back out of that oil pump whenever I flip it over. So I put some of that 30 weight oil directly into it. All I'm doing there is in case those are two impellers that turn, they're steel on steel. That's just cast steel with those two forged impellers in there. And if they're dry, I don't want to go to spinning that oil pump up, you know, and they're initially like steel on steel with no lubricants or whatever. So it's okay. The oil, when I flip the motor over, it's going to run right back out into the pan and everything. But it's going to get those impellers oily just so that I don't initially have any scarring or anything going on like that. So I always do that as well. Um, like I said, we're going to take, uh, I'm probably going to take like a half inch chuck drill and I'm going to run down through the distributor hole and actually pump the system up with oil anyway before I crank the engine, you know, before I stab the distributor in. But that right there is going to keep, even when I'm taking a drill and do it, it's just going to keep me from possibly scratching up an impeller. And I'm sure when they put these together new, they probably have a lubricant that they're putting in them anyway. But uh, better safe than sorry. All right, let's put an oil pan on it. Kind of hard for me to put this oil pan on this engine and I ain't got the time to change the time and cover back on. So <laughs> kind of has to be done in a particular order here, y'all. But yeah, put these plugs back in. I just put thread sealing on them, but permanent Loctite, a lot of people use permanent Loctite on those, so it doesn't matter. Um, as long as they're tight and can't come loose, that's all that matters. Oh, that's tight. All right, put the time chain back on, then we'll put the oil pan on it. And this cam is, it's four degrees advanced, but it's cut to zero, so I just put it on zero. I don't know if any of y'all have had cams done that way, but that's the way that this one, how, uh, how it is. When you put it on zero, the cam is actually four degrees advanced when it's on zero. 
So, um, so if I was to advance it on my timing chain, it would actually advance it more than four degrees. It works great with what I got, so I'm not gonna fool with that. I'm just gonna put it right back together. And I do use, um, I'm using blue Loctite on these and then I'm using a cam lock plate as well. I got a Felpro reusable oil paint gasket and it's just about seen better days, but I'm gonna get this one last, one last run out of it. Get me one more. Give me one more go out of this, out of this gasket. Y'all can tell the way I'm reusing stuff, I am budgeting. This is a budget build on this refresh for this engine. We got too much money tied up in our new engine. We can't tie a bunch of money in this one on gaskets or anything. Gotta put it where I need it. Alright, get them down in them down in the holes there. Oh yeah, that looks good. That looks good. A little bit of a few little places. Right there, right there, right there, right there. It's a couple of places, these jokers. Yeah, right there, right there. I believe that'll work. I believe that'll work. Yes, I made sure I had this thing clean, clean, clean. Come here, there it goes. It takes a little while to get one clean too with the kick out, so you gotta really work at it. Um, when you're putting all these bolts in and everything nice and smooth, tightening it down, be careful, y'all. Um, you can warp an oil pan really easy. You just snug all of these up evenly and quit. And underneath this thing, the only thing I got left is the, um, the oil filter mount. And I throw the oil filter mount on. Same deal here. Um, it's got a little embossed edge on it that seals to that block. No gasket, no nothing, no silicone. It just bolts on. And I've got the spring still in this one. Um, that's a bypass. So the bypass is still active in it. I'm going to leave it alone, put it back in, and then this thing's ready to flip over. We've got the bottom end button back up. You see I've got it turned back over. Where this engine's at now, it's ready for all the valve train to be dropped back in. Of course, we'll put our lifters back into the exact holes they came out of. You know, push rods, rocker arms, and everything. And this one is good to go. We'll be ready to, you know, finish it up, put the carburetor on, put it into the car. We're going to cut this video off here because there's already so many details that we've been through. And it's already running so long. If you stuck with me, you know this video ran long. You know, all in, I'm going to have less than $500 in refreshing this engine. You know, and I really need to keep this engine on a budget because we've got our new crate race an engine that we're having machine work done on now and we got quite a bit of money sunk into that motor so I needed this thing to be on a tight tight budget and I think I've accomplished that and I think this thing can deliver some more wins in our Camaro just like we've built it right here where I want to go next is getting our orange crate racing car out of the shop getting the Camaro into the shop that's our leaf spring car it's got over a season on it you know, since I've really done a major teardown on it. So like maybe we do a couple of videos, pull all the control arms, all the bushings, everything off the car, go through everything, 
put it all back together, string the car, make sure the car is square, put the engine and transmission, everything back in it and set the car up so that we can put Rachel in the best position for her starting out first time ever on the racetrack. I need to have confidence that the car is going to perform the way it should for her. You know, and if you agree with that and you think that's a good direction for us to go, or if there's things that you'd like to see, leave me a comment, let me know. That feedback definitely helps for us to understand what you're looking for. I appreciate and I'll see you next time.